Good morning. It's good to look out and see amid our number so many of our number back with us who were ill that are now feeling better. Uh, it's also uh, oh, that time of year where we're cognizant of the fact that this time of year there just will be seasonal illnesses. It happens every year uh, and it's just one of those things that happens and so we need to be cognizant and aware of the fact that from time to time there may be some others uh, even that are with us today who may be facing illnesses and so we will pray uh, and hope that those uh, will recover just as many are here this morning recovered with us. It's good to look out and see a number of visitors from uh, the state of Arkansas in various areas uh, here locally and in different towns. And it's also good to see Pat Andrews and his wife with us this morning. Glad to have him back with us uh, this morning. And it's good to see Anna Hopper back with us. That's an encouragement for us. Glad she's back with us. And uh, it's so good to see so many visitors I see in different areas as I look out. And uh, I'm glad you're with us. This morning's lesson is one of those that I guess you could ask, uh, why didn't he just say, let's talk about maturity? Why didn't he just say uh, the idea of how interested are we in maturing? Well, I'll, I'll resurface that question throughout the lesson, but I've titled the lesson, On a Scale of 1 to 10. That's what I've titled the lesson. On a scale of 1 to 10, how interested are we in maturing and growing up in Christ? If one is not interested, and the number one would be totally not interested. This, this, so you say, how interested are you growing in Christ or maturing in Christ? And one person just says, I'm not interested at all. And then if a number 10 is altogether interested... The question is, how can we get those less than 10 to get to a 10 in interest? This is that which we will discuss this hour. We're going to talk about the idea of some things that require a scale. I'm sure when you go to various places online and they ask you to rate their items, I know Amazon has a scale of five. I worked for Amazon. They even have their employees have various scales. But uh, as you look at... Uh, uh, scale of 1 to 10, you sometimes will see that in a doctor's office. They'll say, what is your pain level on a scale of 1 to 10? And some people go, eh, it's about a 5. Other people go, it's an 11. <laughs> you know, I mean, so we look at that and we say, what do we do in regards to our maturity? What do we do in our regards to our development in Christian uh, service in such a way that would be wanting to grow? Because when we look at our growth and we look at our development, we all want a 10. We want everybody to say, I want to 100% definitely grow in the Lord. It's kind of like one of those things on the Amazon five-star scale. If you really like it, you give them a five. You don't give them a four because someone might go, well, they didn't really like it. But you give them a five because you really, really like it. That's why on this scale of one to ten, how interested are we in growing up in Christ? We all want a ten. We want everybody in this room to say, I'm very interested. Like, is the top level there could be. And so how do we get there? How do we get from a 3 to a 5 to a 10? What do we do? Well, I think one thing that we could help in understanding in regards to uh, how interested we are uh, in maturing and growing up in Christ, which is the thesis topic for the lesson, how interested are we in doing that, is understanding that a lot of things in the Bible and in the world in which we live in, they require a scale. And we sometimes forget that they actually require a scale. I believe that goodness, just the idea of being good, goodness requires a scale. You say, well, how does goodness require a scale? Think with me, if you will, about a mongoose. A mongoose is a good little creature. It captures a snake. And so we say uh, a mongoose is good because it kills a dangerous snake. But we say, well, that's good. That's goodness. A mongoose can kill a snake. But a man is better because he doesn't wipe out every mongoose. He knows he's good, he's good, and so he's better than a mongoose because he doesn't wipe them all out. But we could say that a family man is better than a player because he's a stand-by-your-one-woman-for-one-man-for-life type of man. So we could say, well, 
the guys that don't kill off all the mongoose, uh, if they're not good morally, they're not as good as a moral person. Yet a man who prays and reads and worships with his wife and kids has more goodness because ultimately Jesus is good. And when we see a man who prays and reads and worships with his wife and kids, that's better than just someone out in the world who just says, well, I'm not committing adultery. They also add to, uh, 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 we could say maybe they're not doing sins of commission, but they're also not uh, engaged in sins of omission. They're adding prayer. They're adding reading of the scriptures. They're adding worship of God and, and a family endurance for that. So ultimately, they have more goodness because ultimately Jesus is good and that's how Jesus is. You say, how is Jesus that way if he doesn't have a wife and kids? Well, Jesus is here when we partake of the Lord's Supper, isn't he? Doesn't it say in the scriptures that he is with us when we partake of the Lord's Supper, that he does that with us? And Jesus is attending in heaven each first day of the week for the Lord's Supper. And Jesus talks to his heavenly Father, so Jesus prays, and Jesus reads scriptures, and we can see where he did that when he was here on earth. And if we go to our Bible scripture for the first scripture that we're going to talk about right now, we'll just turn on to the passage in Ephesians chapter 5, verses 28 through 30, to talk about a great mystery, but it does speak regarding Christ in the church. In Ephesians chapter 5, verses 28 through 32, it says, so a husbands ought to love their own wives as their own bodies. In other words, we are to love them. He who loves his wife loves himself. For no one ever hated his flesh, but nourishes it and cherishes it, just as the Lord does the church. So here we see God is basically saying Jesus nourishes and cherishes the church. Jesus loves and cares for the church. He uses the illustration of the husband who loves and cares for his wife and loves and cares for his own body. But Jesus is the one that is uh, uh, the head of the church and the church is his body. Verse 30 says, For we are members of his body, of his flesh and his bones. For this reason a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. Then he says in verse 32, This is a great mystery, but I speak regarding Christ and the church. So he's made it evident that he speaks concerning Christ in the church. And then he says, Nevertheless, let each one of you in particular so love his own wife as himself, and let the wife see that she respects her husband. Yes, goodness requires a scale. And we sometimes don't look at the elementary level of the idea of a mongoose is good. That's cool. That's in the world. A man is good because he doesn't kill mongooses. That's good. But then a, then a stand by your woman man is better, and then a a spiritual man who prays and studies and reads the Word of God is better yet still. And so when we look at the idea of goodness from Ephesians 5, 28 through 32, we say, why is the one that is doing all the things they should do to mature themselves in the kingdom, why is that better in goodness? Because we see Jesus is the par excellence example of what goodness is. And so we see concerning Christ and the mystery that there is, Jesus Christ is showing us He's at the top of the scale. He is the number one, uh, and He is the, the begotten Son of the Lord, who died and gave His life for the church, and He loves the church as uh, we love our own bodies. He cares for us. He died for us. He's willing to suffer for us and willing to take pains to, to find out ways that where we might be good because we'd see His example and we strive to be good. Okay, so that's a little foundation, just foundation on the word goodness. What about nature? You know, nature requires a scale, and if we're interested in growing up and maturing in Christ, it might be good just to look at the world round about us and see simple observation. Light. What is light? It's raw energy. Well, what, is, what did God create? In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, right? And the earth was without form and void, and darkness was over the face of the deep. And the Lord God said, Let there be light. And it was so. And the evening and the morning were the first day. Then God said, Let there be a firmament in the heavens, which divides the upper waters from the lower waters. And it was so. And the evening and the morning were the second day. So light, raw energy. Or two, water in a firmament, the balance of gravity. 
3. Let the earth bring forth grass and the herb which yields its, its fruit in its season. And so we see that grass is the parts in a plant. And then on day 4, as you know this, sunlight was made. And sunlight and darkness, uh, it, when you have that, have different planting seasons. And then day 5, he made poultry and fish. Well, poultry and fish are more complex than plants and algae, right? And on day six, if the rest of the living creatures are yet more complicated than all of this, we see where nature requires a scale. God explains in the day of creation, when you look at the days from, uh, if you were to look backwards through the week, because that's what I'm trying to explain, backwards through the week is a 10 to a, to a 1, if you will. Light's great. That's important. That's good in nature. That's very important for things. If you don't have light, a plant won't grow. But we're going to go backwards through the week of creation. God's able to rest and say, I'm satisfied in what I was able to create, but I'm still better than all y'all. Because he's God, and he's able to do that, and he's able to rest from his creation and the works which he's done, and he's able to observe the world in which he lives in and have a holy Sabbath day. Fine, he can do that. He's the greatest. He can do all sorts of things, and then amid all the creation and all the things we could ever think of that might be part of the life we're in, he's still better. Okay, so we go from the day seven. Now we go back to day six. Man, the crowning achievement of all of complexity is the dichotomy of working together with our fellow man. Husband and wife working together to strive together to do what is right. It is the most complex thing God has made. Man and woman, men and women, they talk about spiritual things. A, a, a dog and a cat, they may, be, they may be animals, but they don't sit around thinking, I wonder how my soul is today and if I should go to church services today on a Sunday, they don't think of that because they're animals based on instinct. We as humans, we think on religious, spiritual things. Every month I read about emotional intelligence and leadership communication and ways in which we think about thinking. I read about those things. They're on the computer, so I read about them. I also receive a lovely National Geographic. Whoever got me that catalog subscription, thank you. Still not quite sure who got me that gift, but it's pretty cool. Um, and it's, it's good. It's a catalog from the society that speaks of the wonders of nature. And now light and space and water and plants and animals, they're good. They're good because of God's scale. And, and none of them choose religion. Only the species of man and women choose religion. So if we look at the idea of nature and a scale, the amazing things animals do in the worlds in which we live in is cool. The growth and development of plants is very neat. Uh, the idea of uh, light and darkness and interstellar star systems, that's fine. But the sky is a map for us. Day by day, the person travels uh, in the road. They look to their left before 12 a.m., and what do they see? Well, they get to see if the sun is on that side or the other side, so they know whether they're going north, south, whether they're, whether it's, you know, which side of the hemisphere they're in. And it's not very complicated when you're driving at daytime to figure out which direction you're going. I mean, some people go, I'm not direction since I don't have a sense of direction. The sun, if you can determine whether it's on your west or east uh, before high noon or after high noon, helps you know whether you're going to the east or west. It's kind of like in my porch when I look outside at nighttime. The sun is always shining facing the porch, always, because every time the sun sets, we're on a globe that shows a certain way that is a pattern. And that's cool, that's neat, but man is more important than that. The nighttime stars, they're a sky map. They're a sky map for the mar maritime travelers at night or for the guys going out camping in the middle of the night and want to see where's the North Star finding that through the, the constellation Little Bear. And so you go out there and you can find all that. That's pretty cool, but it's not as cool and not as impressive as the scale God made number 10, which is men and women thinking about religion. So all through that scale, raw energy, that's cool. Water and firmament, that's more cool. Grass and parts of plants, that helps sustain our food. Sunlight and darkness, that helps grow the plants. And we could go on and on and on to find out the prime amazing portion of the scale is in all of that mankind is the highest level of the scale, except for God, who's of course above us, 
who even in everything we could do spiritually, he could rest and still be above us in the scale. Kind of cool analogy if you hadn't thought of that in that way, but there's more to the story. There's the sermon. <laughs> and now we get to the sermon. Spirituality requires a scale. I don't know why I put 2 Thessalonians 3, 6 on there. That's about withdrawing from one another. Turn to 1 Thessalonians 3 through 6 and look at that passage for just a moment. You have to know your scriptures and know when you have a typo and everybody, typos happen. So we go to 1 Thessalonians chapter 3 and 6 and it says, Now that Timothy has come to us from you and brought us good news of your faith and your love, and that you always have good remembrance of us, greatly desiring to see us, 1 Timothy 3, 6, greatly desiring to see us as we also to see you. Spirituality requires a scale. In the city of Thessalonica, the people there were facing great persecution. This was the town wherein they threw rocks at him. They threw rocks at Paul and then... They had chased him over from Thessalonica to the, to the adjoining town of Lystra and Derby, which we studied in past sermons not too long ago. But Timothy was the product of Lystra and Derby. That's where he grew up. Timothy was from that area. And he came at a time of still becoming a Christian and facing righteousness at a time of immense persecution when his Jewish countrymen, not in Jerusalem, but Jewish by faith and by nationality, were straining against the gospel. Spirituality requires a scale. He was new in the faith. He was very new in the faith. Goodness and the orders of things are not the lone indicators of maturity and growing up in Christ. Wise meditations applied are thus, babe in Christ or child in Christ, maturing, and then one that is more mature. Not saying achieved the top of maturity, but babe in Christ, maturing, and more mature. When he writes 1 Thessalonians chapter 3 and verse 6, it is possible... I'm not going to say it is a must, because, you know, like the Hebrew writer wrote Hebrews. It's probably Paul, but we still say the Hebrew writer. Same thing with uh, uh, Ecclesiastes and Solomon. But it is very close to probable that this book is the first book of the New Testament. That chronologically, 1 Thessalonians is the absolute first book that was ever written. And if that's the case, he's writing to a child in Christ that is a babe in Christ. He's new. Timothy is very new in his faith. He's not writing 2 Timothy to Timothy when Paul says, Finally, I've poured out my life as a drink offering to the Christ, and my time of my departure is at hand. He's not saying I'm about to die. He's saying, Timothy, you're about to be a babe in Christ and growing and developing and about to be a young preacher. And you're about to serve the Lord. And you're knowing that your importance is important to me too. He says, Timothy has come to us from you. Timothy went as soon as he was a Christian and brought good news of their faith and love and that they always had good remembrance of Paul amid the persecutions they had. He says, we also desire to see you. Therefore, brethren, in all of our affliction and distress, we were comforted concerning you by your faith. For now we live if you stand fast in the Lord. For what thanks can we render to God for you all for the joy with which we rejoice for your sake before our God night and day, praying exceedingly that we may seek your face and perfect what is lacking in your faith. He's saying very clearly, Timothy is growing. He's developing in the faith. And spirituality requires a scale. And if he started out right, we can get on the right foot too. And so it, we can all get on the right foot in Christianity. And he uses that illustration of that young Timothy in, second, in 1 Thessalonians 3, 6 to talk about that. 1 Corinthians chapter 3 and verse 1 gives us more information. He says, do we begin again to commend ourselves? Do we need as some others epistles of commendation to you or letters of commendation, commendation to you? He's saying, as apostles... They didn't need a resume. I mean, there's no way an apostle ever needed a resume. You know, Eutychus, you fell out of a window. There you go. You're risen from the dead. I mean, you need a resume? He's an apostle, right? Can we, can we clarify that? I was meant to be a little funny, a little sarcasm there. But I think Bob got my joke. He's still laughing. So we look at that, but we get the idea. That Paul doesn't need a letter of recommendation. But you know what he says? You are our letter of commendation to us. 
You are our epistle written in our hearts, known and read by all men. Clearly you are an epistle of Christ ministered by us, written not with ink but with the Spirit of the living God, not on tablets of stone but on tablets of flesh, that is of the heart, and he has trust that they will mature. So now they're not going to be a babe in Christ when he's in 1 Corinthians and he's writing back to the letter uh, of the questions that Chloe's household had regarding certain things. He's writing back to them and telling now they'll grow, now they'll develop, now they'll be stronger in the faith. Timothy will be sent to them so that they will understand more readily the things that they will need to know, but they will be growing and developing in the most holy faith. They will be applying the idea of once a babe in Christ, but then maturing and then striving to be mature like Paul. We need to recognize that the way we get there is meditating deeply on the words of the Lord. When the, when the Christians got the epistle of 2 Corinthians, Perhaps they had read some of the other epistles, I don't really know, but all that we know for sure they had read was 1 Corinthians. They had to wait until they gained revelation, whereby their prophecies and their speaking in tongues would cease, right? That's their era. They have 1 Corinthians and 2 Corinthians. They would get other letters. There would come a time where they would get the full 27 books of the New Testament. But at their level, they needed to meditate on what they had. We're at a different level, brethren. We have 27 books of the New Testament, and we have preserved for us all the Old Testament. It is so preserved for us that we have no excuse for not meditating on the will of the Lord. We need to meditate and become mature, but then we recognize the passage of Scripture that Paul speaks of in Philippians chapter 3 and verse 12, and we recognize something that needs to be emphasized in this study very clearly. We can grow, we can mature in the faith, but in Philippians chapter 3 and verse 12, he says, not that I've already attained. Yeah, we got to focus on this. A lot of people say, okay, so they're a child, they grow, they develop, they get to the liminal stage, then they're an adult and they mature and they've got everything. To, man, they're a Christian. They go to church Sunday, morning, Sunday, evening, Wednesday night, do good deeds, they're good. They're, they're good. They've been a Christian 30 years, 40 years. They're good. Paul wasn't that way. Paul said in verse 12, not that I have already attained, not that I am already perfected, but I press on that I may lay hold for which Christ of that for which Christ Jesus has also laid hold of me. You recognize what he's saying? I've been seized by the Lord and he's got me on my shoulders and he's saying, go forward, keep plowing, Paul. Keep going forth in the gospel, in the power of the spirit that you have. Keep serving the Lord with righteousness and with holiness and, and with love for which no, if you don't have, you won't see the Lord. He's saying, recognize that the spirit of disposition here is not that I've already attained. That's what he's talking about. He's saying, I haven't attained yet. And so that basically is saying a maturity that's humble. If you just want to simplify it down to one word, Paul's maturity is humble. He recognizes he can learn things from Peter. He recognizes he can learn things from Timothy. He realizes he can learn things from Jesus, even as he grows and develops in the faith. Paul is a man. Jesus is all man but all God. And so if there is a level of maturity that is perfect, it is Jesus. But knowing that we're not Jesus but have him as our example gives us the not that I've already attained mindset, the humble mindset. And that's very important because in our spirituality, in requiring our scale, if we're always down and out to say, I can't achieve greater things, will stop. And so he's basically telling us this scale is a sliding scale. <laughs> and so that's kind of important to remember. Verse 13, let's read. Brethren, I do not count myself to have apprehended, but one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind. Forgetting those things and reaching forward to those things which are ahead. When we develop this context, that's when we develop the process of growth. When we develop the context 
of forgetting what's behind and reaching forward to the things which, we, which are ahead, that is the growth process. We sometimes don't see a tree just grow unless we're watching National Geographic and they hold the fast forward button, right? You've all seen this. And lo and behold, a little oak tree just grows to this giant oak tree. We don't see that. I yeah, have the tape rolling for a long time to see that. But you know what? I've seen many brethren throughout the years that they've said, I don't really think so and so will mature. And then they go, whoa, what happened? That person grew. That person developed. That person's spiritual. I never would have thought he or she would develop. But lo and behold, they're doing stuff that I'm not doing. And so we need to recognize with that growth kind of sometimes happens behind us or in the, in the shadows, and we don't realize what growth is actually commencing. I think one of the things we need to remember here is that some people were forgetting that which was behind and reaching forward to that which is ahead. They were leaving off the sins and the weights which so easily ensnares us and running before them to the race that was set before them. They were setting their eyes on the prize of Jesus Christ, the author and perfecter of their faith, who for the joy set before them endured the cross, but has sat down at the right hand of the throne of the majesty on high. They were pressing on. They were reaching forward. They were longing for that heavenly home. And so we first, in order to gain the right meditation, uh, when we're just thinking about our spirituality, is first knowing that we can't be a baby all the time. We've got to grow up. At some point, we can't just be, you know, focusing on eight passages. We've got to develop to read some of the ones we're reading this morning, the idea of, uh, the idea of growing or maturing in the faith. And that means leaving off the sins, leaving off the weights, leaving off the things that are weighing us down in the world to where we basically get distracted by ourselves. Because what the weights in this world actually are, are things we enjoy, things we like to do, things of our own nature that really distract us where Satan goes, don't have to worry about them right now, they're doing their thing, I'll go to somebody else. Because they're already in the world. And so we need to remember that. Verse 16, Nevertheless, to the degree that we have already attained, let us walk by the same rule, let us be of the same mind. So then someone goes, well, is Paul being hypocritical here? Because he just said, I haven't attained, but we're going to attain. That's the whole point of the sermon. <laughs> That's why I brought this out. He says, nevertheless, to the degree that we have already attained, let us walk by the same rule and be of the same mind. There is a way everybody in this audience, everybody standing here, everybody listening to this message can say, I will go to heaven. There is a way you can have the confidence that says, I know I will go to heaven. I know with full assurance in whom I place my trust. I know that He will deliver me from this world of dust. I know that I can go to heaven. I know that I can be there. And part of that is maturing to the point where you recognize His will and recognize that you can attain. You may not attain full measures of as mature as other people, but we're not classifying ourselves by ourselves. We're classifying ourselves by how close are we getting to Jesus and how much am I growing and developing to be more like Jesus. The ten-talent man is not going to be held accountable for the things of the five-talent man, nor will the one that uh, comes to the vineyard later in life be held by the same standard of the one that's grown up in the church, if you will. So if you look at the context there, he's saying that there is a scale that you can attain. He says, nevertheless, to the degree that we have already attained, walk by the same rule. And so he tells us in this disposition of exposition of those things that are written that helps us understand how to mature and how to grow up in the most holy faith, he says you can attain by doing something. And he gives a specificity of what to do. He says, stay on course. Stay by the rules and play by the rules and love it. Sometimes I'll watch a football game. And I'll say, eh, that's my team, but they did a bad penalty, pass interference. Here's the flag, false start on the offense. Well, I was going for the offense. Am I gonna go, no, 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 my team never, never has any fouls. No, that's the context here. He's saying you play by the rules and you understand there is a standard. The world we, in which we live in takes this, takes this Bible and shreds it up. They don't do so literally, but they do so in doctrinal disposition of ways of dissension of the scriptures. They say, I take this passage, you take this passage, and as long as we believe Jesus died, was buried, and arose, it doesn't matter what doctrine you believe in, because it just doesn't matter as long as Jesus loves us. That's not right. 
And he says so in this verse. He says, walk by the same rule and be of the same mind. Unity is not agreeing to disagree. Unity is agreeing to agree on the things which Jesus has said, standing for those things which he has mandated by the holy will of the Lord and saying very clearly, I know that the Bible speaks and I will speak where it speaks. Where it's silent, I'll be silent. And I'll do Bible things in Bible ways, call Bible things by Bible names. And in all things, love and charity. And in all things I do, I will do so kindly and nicely and respectfully and honorably. Because some things we don't know. Deuteronomy says, for the secret things belong to God, but those things which have been revealed belong to us and our generations forever. So as we look at the context of this, we need to remember that spirituality does require a scale. First, meditating on the focus points of the basics of the scriptures, being a baby or a child in Christ, then developing and growing to mature in the faith, to put away sin and put on righteousness, to put on the whole armor of God that we may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil and having done all to stand, stand therefore and then putting on the panoply of God, Ephesians 6, and then recognizing that based on that, we need to get to the point where we say, I know he's got a standard, I know he set forth doctrine, and I can understand the will of the Lord, and I will walk in the same rule. I will walk by the same rule, but not only that, I'll also be of the same mind. For let this mind of Christ be in you, which also was in Christ, that he... Uh, in the form of God, did not find it robbery to be uh, equal with God. He basically said, I, in my mind and in my service to the Lord, I'm going to do whatever the Heavenly Father wants me to do. And Jesus Christ was making the case plain that he was going to do what the Father did. Philip, have you been with me so long that you have not seen the Father? If you've seen me, you've seen the Father. For it is no longer I who live, but Christ Jesus who liveth in me. So we see the pattern. Jesus followed God the Father. God the Father's words were in Jesus, were in Jesus. Christ liveth in us spiritually, not physically. He's not coming down from heaven dwelling us in a mortal body, but He is with us. And so with that recognition, we're spiritual, and it's growing in the scale. We have other verses to continue on in our study. As we look at Galatians chapter 2 and verse 20, our good scriptures state this, I have been crucified with Christ. It's no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God. You're in Christ and you're with Christ. You're connected to Him. He loved me. He gave Himself for me. I don't set aside the grace of God. For if righteousness comes only through the law, then Christ died in vain. If we're focusing only on the Old Testament, and forgetting about the Christ of the New Testament, it's vanity for that which he set forth. Spirituality requires a scale. And you can study the 39 books of the Old Testament and be as well versed in the Old Testament scriptures as you can, but you could still be as lost as Saul of Tarsus was before he was baptized by Ananias. And so we need to remember that. Revelation chapter 22, how interested are we in growing up in Christ Jesus? A spiritual takeaway from the activities of life is generally Christ liveth in me. But in Revelation chapter 22, we learn that we're not longing for death, yet anticipating the heavenly home. For he says, Lord, come quickly. Is Paul saying, excuse me, John the Revelator, who's writing that, is he saying, I give up? Is Jesus saying that? No, he's saying, I long for heaven. I anticipate the heavenly home. This world is what it is but I will find joy that transcends the particular battles here on this earth. And so this morning we conclude with the words of uh, 1 Thessalonians 3, wherein we had our scripture reading this morning by Brother Kelly, very eloquent reading and very good reading. I thank you, Brother Kendall, for that. And turn in our Bibles now to our final chapter of 1 Thessalonians 3, verses 8 through 9, wherein it says this, we now live. I like that. Uh, we have our struggles in life, but where do I find the most peace? Right here in these walls. I don't understand that, the world says. Why, why worship so much? Why be so interested in, in things of a holy nature? Because here's how the world thinks. The world thinks, hmm, I don't like Monday. I really don't like Sunday, but Friday's my favorite day of the week. 
You know how the Christian thinks? Friday's a nice day. Monday's a nice day. But I wish Sunday were seven days long. Hear the difference? For now we live if you stand fast in the Lord. For what thanks can we render to God for you? For all the joy with which we rejoice for your sake. Before our God, night and day praying exceedingly that we may see your face and perfect what is lacking in your faith. And that's what he wrote. And that's what we recognize. On a scale of 1 to 10, how interested are we in growing up in Christ? I hope we all say 10. We're all really interested in it. But then with this lesson, I hope we've been able to have some takeaways, some things we can bring home and some applications whereby we may understand just how we do that and how we understand that process. What if you're not a Christian this morning? What do you need to do? Well, first of all, you need to have faith. Faith comes by hearing the Word of God. You need to have faith. But you need to recognize you need to be baptized for the forgiveness of sins. Acts 22, 16 says, why are you waiting? Why are you putting this off? Arise and be baptized and wash away your sins, calling on the name of the Lord. 1 Peter 3, 21, baptism doth now save us. I don't know how we can get more clear than that. If you want your sins washed away, the washing of the water through the Word in the water washes away your sins. It's not some sort of magic water. It's not like, ooh, we're pouring magic water on you. It has nothing to do with that. It has to do with obedience to the Lord. If God said, jump up and down and do 10 jumping jacks, and that's what would save you, then that's what we'd be doing. But we're not doing that because He said, He who believes and is baptized shall be saved. He who does not believe shall be condemned. Belief plus baptism equals salvation. So if you're not a Christian, mature, grow up in Christ. Be like Timothy who said, amid the challenges, amid all the rough roads in Thessalonica, I will go and help Paul in the cause of the gospel. That's a babe in Christ who's got mature starting elements, but he's got a lot of zeal. He's ready to help Paul. And then we see through Paul's writings to the Thessalonians as well, the Corinthian brethren in 2 Corinthians, that he writes mature and continue to grow up in the most holy faith. And so as you become a Christian, everything doesn't just, all challenges just dissipate and just vanish away. Then becomes the journey wherein you walk in newness of life. And in the newness of life, you grow and you mature and you develop into who you need to be for the Lord. If we can help you do that, be baptized for the forgiveness of sins and then walk in newness of life. If we can help you do that, please come forward and sit on one of the front rows while we stand, while we sing.